The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to it Wednesdays here at Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, hope you do it all right. We'll get our starting five, our shout-outs in the stream here in a moment. We were a little tardy on that yesterday, but uh, still got it handled. The Hale Varsity YouTube channel is where you can watch the show, hear us across the Hale Varsity radio network, and dial us up at 489-1240, 489-1240, toll-free, 800-825-5865. I assume the 800 line works. Uh, with our new phone system. But uh, either way, you got a couple of numbers to choose from. Can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com and, and also find us on Twitter. Can watch the show that way as well. Like and follow Hail Varsity Radio. Twitter at HVarsity Radio. Find and follow Elijah at Herbal Essence at Schmidt underscore radio for me and different social media platforms and stations across the state, you can hear us. We will dive headfirst like we're uh, trying to take a bag at second on the anonymous coaches in the Big Ten. And what teams are you intrigued by this coming football season in the new and expanded and air quote better Big Ten? We'll get some thoughts on that. Baseball and Stillwater in Nebraska. Mike Babcock from Hale Varsity and Heard at Sports in about 15 minutes. We'll uh, get Babbers loaded up. Uh, he's hopefully wearing a tie dye, but if you're not, Mike, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk some baseball. And uh, also some football perspective from Mike. Evan Bland from the Omaha World Herald joins us in our two at five. His thoughts on Nebraska and the baseball trek down to Stillwater. You got to be feeling pretty good about how wide open this is. Good stuff from Jabba Chamberlain. If you missed that yesterday, podcast has it, Spotify, iTunes, and Google Play. So there's several Twitter handles I like to, to follow. And there's there's one in, in town that does a pretty good job of following some news events, not necessarily sporting events, but news events. And one is the Lincoln Scanner and shout out Lincoln Scanner. They have no free shout outs. They have updates on fires and criminal activity and I, I, I do believe that was a free shout-out, but no free shout-out, Schmitty. Well, yes, because I've got to give, and we, we got to give Lincoln Scanner credit and our dear friend Michael Brunt, who, who quote tweeted this. And apparently, uh, this happened back on the 27th. So, the tweet goes like this. We're going to have to add uh, Macon Whoopi to go complete old man at Don and Millie's parking lot to the growing list of things that we should not be doing. <laughs> so here's the thing. As a wonderful husband, wait, I, wait where are you going with that? I, I <laughs> asked my wife, I texted the bunny. I'm like, hey, bunny, I, I sent her this screenshot. Do you want to go to, to Don and Millie's for dinner? I'll buy. And she immediately shot back, you know, WTF, and I'm, and I'm like, please clarify. <laughs> <laughs> and then she sent an, an obscene hand gesture to me again. So I just thought I'd start the show off that way. Hey, the thing is with, is, with parking lots and, and holidays and places to to maybe not go do that. When you have margarita machines like they got at Don and Millie's, you never know what can <laughs> so happen. So who's doing the free shout outs now? We don't know if it was before or after Marg time. I have a feeling. <laughs> Something tells me. I, th- I think I have a pretty good idea. Um. <laughs> but I, I mean, this whole story is funny, but her response, WTF, question mark. Could be what or what. Yes. <laughs> and I, I said, please, 
please clarify, sweet. Ju- Justin sweetness. asks, is, which Don and Millie's? He's trying to get in. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great. He's trying to go p- p- camp that's out in the parking the, lot and that's, wait for opportunities. That's, that's, the, that's the question. All right. A little, a little gutter mind uh, working here. Uh, NASCAR Eric checks in first. Uh, happy hump day to you, NASCAR Eric. Uh, as as he's in, KG is in as well. Brian is also in at number three. And you, Grandpa, four. Part of the Boulder Peace Treaty, Jeff Snitley, five. Uh, the other Brian in at six. Walter says, bleep Colorado. We are just all themed up today, aren't we? Uh, Walter from just outside of Philly. Patrick says, boom. Patrick, good work. Uh, for for jumping in. Justin is here. Sal. Sal, good to have you. Jeff is in. Jimmy is in. Uh, Good to have Cliff. Cliff is in. Uh, Cliff wrote in on Gator Skin Boots. Cliff down in Florida. Good to have you, my friend. And uh, we'll have more of your comments and thoughts as uh, we proceed. Uh, Brent is in as well. Uh, Good work. John Cook, the man. And uh, good for John Cook. You had that in your news, Elijah, that uh, Mr. Cook getting a raise uh, on Saturday. Keep that man happy. Keep that man on the bench. Uh, Good for him. So uh, I I like that. To elaborate, does this feel like a a one last contract before he rides off into retirement? I feel like for like three or four years now we've been asking the question, how much longer does John Cook have? As um, long as John Cook wants to have. And that's what I'm saying. Like, like I look at five years from now, I go, I wonder if that's going to be the time where he, he hangs He's up. not 70 yet, is he? 67, 68? Somewhere. He's, I, I mean, he's pretty close. He, doesn't look, he looks maybe 60. Let's, let's, let's look this up. You're 68? Look, is he 68? 68 years old. What's the Social Security age? Is that 60? 60? 66. 66, so... Mm-hmm. Well, you can still get it. So, so something tells me that eight hundred twenty-five thousand years is probably better than the Social Security. I don't well, know. But you get a seventy thousand dollar retention bonus, and then you get annual bumps as well mm-hmm. through twenty twenty-nine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's probably better than Social Security. It's probably, maybe just looking at Social Security and doing some finances here. And hey, man, being volleyball coach in Nebraska is a pretty good monetary opportunity. Well, I mean, he's <laughs> he's earned it. He's incredible. And well, with, and, and that's that's something that is unique is that at Nebraska. Being the volleyball coach is a good monetary opportunity, which it's not, the, it's not like that everywhere in the country. No, it's not. But at least with Cook and programs of similar ilk, and there may not be, but you have your, your, your volleyball powerhouses. Who knows what, what they're making, but with Cook earning that number, uh, everybody else hopefully gets to eat as well. Uh, Eric is in, uh, says margaritas were too strong. Uh, couldn't wait till home. <laughs> There's maybe a, an admission of guilt. Hopefully it's not true, Eric. Uh, Tuck is in. Uh, and Mike Babcock is in the green room. Let's talk anonymous coaches. <laughs> wait, do you see Tuck? What? Tuck says, I need to remove Social Security from my vocabulary. I'm going to be stuck on the board for eternity. <laughs> wow. That's, that's not nice. It's <laughs> not real nice. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk anonymous coaches. And just to give you the, the rundown here, the spitball, we'll, we'll read Nebraska's. But the, the summary is Nebraska is going to break through this year. Athlon puts out their anonymous coaches' comments on teams around different leagues. They've focused in on the Big Ten. Nebraska will break through this year with Matt Rule, with Dylan Raiola, with Tony White, with the defense returning, with the schedule, with the setup. There's all that math that says Nebraska will have a really good year. The question is, is how good is good? What's the breakthrough level? Is it seven and five and you win a couple of ball games or in, or you're in a couple of ball games that you're not favored in? I know uh, I saw a line online that says Nebraska's favored by 28 over at UTEP to open. I've not gone down the list yet of, of uh, games and early lines yet for Nebraska. That's a later in the week project, but we'll we'll hit that. So Nebraska, what's their breakthrough? Is it 10 or 9 wins? Is it right around 8? Is it contention for Indy in this setup? So we'll, we'll discuss Nebraska and the, 
the level of breakthrough. You've got Ohio State that's kind of your co-favorite along with Oregon. The rundown is is culture. Does it stay within the lines without a Jim Harbaugh? Does Sharon and Sharon Moore and, and staff keep on keeping on? Because you look at Brian Shaw, and he coached a lot of good teams and had a lot of good years and had some of his own good years. It wasn't all inheritance at Stanford from from Harbaugh. It helped. It helped kind of build, and then it, it just fizzled. What's what's the staying power of a Michigan without Harbaugh, with all of that depleted roster that went to the NFL with those lines of scrimmage? Now, presumably, Michigan's just going to reload the way they've been developing and recruiting. Does, does it stay as strong under uh, the new head coach in Michigan? With Ohio State, it is very simple. It may not be national championship or bust, but it is beat Michigan or bust, or it could get real uncomfortable for Ryan Day, which is just crazy to say. But you've had past high win percentage coaches run out of Columbus for eight or nine wins or, or, or ten win seasons. I mean, it's incredible. Before Trestle got there, I mean, Ohio State was as good as it got with front first-round talent that performed to the NFL at wideout, at offensive line, and at running back, and they can never, ever get by Michigan. The book on Oregon, they are your playoff contender. doesn't matter that they're new. What they have and the way they're built – On the lines of scrimmage is ready to rock in the Big Ten, plus their quarterback, Dylan Gabriels, won and played in a lot of big games. Penn State, did they finally get over the hump, or are they just exiled to 9-3 and every year? Iowa, are they different on offense in just a first year without little Brian? Because defense and special teams, you just reprint it because it's going to be good. Rutgers... How much can they keep building? Can they keep climbing? Their recruiting's been good. They beat the teams they're supposed to beat, and they fight pretty hard with teams they're less talented than. Indiana, does a new coach make a difference? This guy loves to talk, did great at James Madison. Uh, it shows some seriousness by Indiana administration to go get Chingretti. And we uh, also look at a team like Illinois, a team that looked like they're on the verge of maybe – kind of being in contention for the West when there was a West. They took a step back last year after two years ago being really solid. They were right there. And forgive me, but did they go bowling in year one under Bielema, or are they a five and seven squad? Mm. They might. They went bowling. They lost bowling. to Leach's squad, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. So their momentum's about dead if they don't have a winning season. I think that's very fair. And the book on two of the newbies in the Pac-12, now to the Big Ten, UCLA and Washington, it's rude awakening. But Washington under Jed Fish is at least positioned to rebuild and, and win some ball games. Wisconsin, the question uh, by the anonymous coaches, all right, the offense that was Stone Age worked and worked well in Madtown. Uh, was it just a year one deal with this three and four wide set and if you're Wisconsin can you take a second year of a bad offense you had mismatched personnel think of Joe Daly in Nebraska in 2004 with the Callahan offense you get recruited to run some option and spread and you're throwing the football in a west coast what's your skill set right Minnesota are they ready to fall off a cliff Sounds like P.J. chased UCLA and about every other job that was open. And the other question here from the anonymous coaches, USC. All right, you hired UCLA's defensive coordinator. Uh, You brought in a uh, a head coach at North Dakota State, an incredible program that scares a lot of Power 5 schools to, uh, to help run your defense as well. Can your talent match the demand from both of these new coaches? And USC's, it's been a long time since they've looked like they've needed to look on the lines of scrimmage. And oh yeah, Caleb Williams is now in the Windy City. So that's the question mark about USC. Very fair 
outlook. We didn't hit everybody, but it sounds like it in the Big Ten. I don't think you can hit everybody in the Big Ten in one segment anymore. No, I, <laughs> we're, we have 90 seconds left. But uh, we'll dive more into Nebraska. We'll get Mike Babcock's thoughts. But if I'm circling some teams I'm intrigued by, I'm super intrigued by Michigan. I, I've kind of accepted what I think Penn State is, good but not good enough, the best of the good. I look at Nebraska, I believe they are going to break through. I think it's some some time away, but I think Indiana can can challenge, not of anything of substance, but at least be somebody you don't want to really see on a Saturday. They, they could get to that point. I think it is do or, time, do or die time for Illinois and Minnesota. And I think you give Iowa a couple of years, but I think if you get them a lot like Nebraska, any semblance of a competent offense – uh, watch out. And I think this is the year for Nebraska to have a really good breakthrough because you don't know how much longer you're going to have Tony White. I don't doubt that Nebraska will start to look like a program that can reload, get to that point versus rebuild. But right now you're pretty loaded if you get competent and good quarterback play. Yeah, well, the, that's the question for this year is, is how big is the big breakthrough? And to me, it comes down to turnovers. To how much does Dylan Ryle help that in special teams? Are you better on special teams than you were? Those are the two questions in terms of how big can the breakthrough be. To, to elaborate on your point about intriguing teams, I'm with you on Michigan. The question is, is how much of his own fingerprints does Moore want to put on the program or how much of it is a continuation of what Harbaugh was doing? One more name. It ain't broke. On. USC, they're really intriguing to me. Mm-hmm. With some new pieces, some transfer portal additions on defense, how can you be in the Big Ten? Probably going to be the most prolific passing attack, but maybe the worst front seven. Could be. We'll see what the quarterback is. Mike Babcock's on the way. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbo. We welcome in. Mr. Husker Football, it's Mike Babcock at MD Babs on Twitter with Hale Varsity and Heard at Sports. Get Mike's bi weekly newsletter on uh, Big Red Football with uh, at um, the email address. Send it to Mike B at Heard at Sports.com. Babbers, we got another Grateful Dead sighting, my friend. Uh, let's talk about the tie dye here. Uh, this one is uh, another concert one or just a cool looking one uh no it's not a concert one it's like uh got it just a yeah skeleton i love it so i've been in a a bill walton mood super sad about the big red dead head as he was titled the honorary member the inductee to the grateful dead hall of fame so i was listening to some grateful dead while i was grilling last night I always kind of smiled when uh, Father Time, a.k.a. Bill Walton, would count down shows. And uh, too bad, too young for for Bill Walton. Any interactions with, with Bill Walton, Mike, or just from afar seeing and watching his career? No, no interactions, uh, just from afar. Um, I saw the, uh, there was a, feature or documentary or something that showed his Grateful Dead room or whatever. It was amazing what, <laughs> yeah, it what is, he had. It is teepee. <laughs> yeah, what he had collected. It was incredible. But, uh, yeah, it's one of the reasons. I know you told me to wear another one of these today, and I also wore it in honor of Bill, Bill Walton. That was a really sad uh, situation learning that he had passed. But uh, he, was, uh, he was the ultimate uh, Grateful Dead fan. There's no question about that. No, he was and great ball player and, and just a good good human, man. Really, really good dude. And one of those guys, he, we, we have bucket lists, either as a sports fan or whatever career you're in. And he was one guy, man, I was always wanting to, to interview and just never had a contact or a way to, to reach out other than the Bill Walton basketball camp. So... Uh, every every uh, every summer would send an email. Hey, uh, too old for your camp, but <laughs> <laughs> I I tried. Uh, but uh, man, gonna miss Bill Walton and his his insight and his moments of the conference of champions with him and Dave Pash. Always liked uh, Pac-12 basketball after dark with Bill Walton and loved his his joy I'm- with uh, 
talking music and talking sports. I'm just imagining Bill Walton sitting in his living room looking through the applications for the Bill Walton camp. A 35-year-old man in Nebraska wants to come and join the Bill Walton <laughs> basketball He keeps camp. emailing that? every year <laughs> and has for the last 15. What the hell? Uh, now what's the deal here? <laughs> he's too short to play. Uh, Mike, let's uh, dive into these anonymous coaches uh, from Athlon in the Big Ten. And we kind of laid out last segment where uh, Nebraska is pegged, and, and they're pegged to uh, to be one of those breakthrough teams. Let's discuss the level of breakthrough before we get a team or two you're intrigued by. And they really like what Matt Rule's done. They really like what Matt Rule's recruited. They understand that you don't want to get rolling downhill too fast, too furious with potentially a freshman quarterback. All that said, the quote is this, they're going to break through this year. It's just a question of how big they should definitely be bowling. And it's all about the quarterback, the freshman Dylan Raiola. They've tried to, to slow play it as much as possible, but he's clearly their best option, the most talented, the guy who makes the system work. Uh, reaction to a couple of those anonymous quotes now we've parsed through every year around this time when this story comes out about the fact that it's anonymous but it's still pretty insightful what what defines breakthrough for you is it bowl or is it level of bowl or is it a win total uh well first of all i think they'll beat uh, texas el paso i i'm you can mark that but, down. But Mike, will they cover? <laughs> <laughs> back in the day, you know, back in the day, it was the University of L Intercept, Texas L Intercepted Paso. <laughs> they had a, they had a wow. problem throwing interceptions. <laughs> Look at Babbers, the shade. I love it. I don't think uh, we in the Husker media can say anything about intercepted passes after the past couple of seasons. <laughs> no, no. For or uh, against. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. For me, a breakthrough is, is probably defined by, well, I have a hard time separating. One is they need to be bowl eligible. You know, I think that if you're bowl eligible, that means something. But you can be six and six and be bowl eligible. And I think this team has the ability to be better than six and six. So I'm probably looking at a win total. I'm looking at seven or eight wins, I think is is a reasonable expectation. I don't think that you automatically, you know, you go from where they were to nine or ten wins. I I, I just, I don't think that's going to happen. With the schedule, um, the backloaded schedule? Yeah. I mean, if it does, I mean, great. If that's, if that's a breakthrough, if that's what it is, I think that's great. But I think it's more reasonable to expect – seven, eight wins. Um, I, I think that's even dramatic, mm-hmm. you know, given where the program was and given what happened last season, um, to come back and, and win uh, uh, seven or eight games, I think is, is pretty impressive. And you do it with a, with a freshman quarterback, uh, probably. And uh, that's the way I would define it. And, I, you know, I, as we've talked before, it, depends on the guys up front, you know, the offensive line, uh, whether they can uh, do the protection and open the holes necessary to get the offense going. It's not just uh, Dylan Riola. It's Mike Babcock with us here on Hale Varsity Radio talking Nebraska, potential breakthrough season. What does that look like? And Mike, one of the things you've heard a lot, not just through the past couple of months, but really through the past year and a half, is that Matt Rule's history of rebuilds is – Starts out bad, there's some incremental progress, and then there's a real breakthrough in year three. People argue that, well, Nebraska in year one was more like year two because of where they started out talent-wise. It wasn't as bad as Baylor and and Temple. Does the history to you with Matt Rule's previous rebuilds matter, or or do you think that every single rebuild is a a new case study, if you will, that you can't expect to replicate results just as it's done at, at Temple and Baylor because it's a different conference, it's a different team, there's different challenges, or do you think there's something to that that Matt Rule... Whenever things do pop, they pop significantly everywhere he goes. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that, that, that what happened at Temple and what happened at Baylor is applicable to Nebraska necessarily. But what you look at is, well, 
look at look at the ability of the coach. Look what he did uh, at these two places. Um, he accomplished pretty dramatic change in in three seasons at those two schools. That doesn't mean it's going to happen at Nebraska. That doesn't mean that you should apply it to Nebraska. But again, we're talking about I think a significant turnaround if you get seven or eight wins uh, based on what happened last year. But I don't think that it and it, it further reflects his ability as a coach to get things done. But like you said, it's a different conference. It's different time and place. You know, the game changes. It continues to change. Um, and it's, it's just a different situation. Um, but we know what that he's shown what kind of a coach he can be uh, at the collegiate level, and he has experience in the NFL, even though it didn't go exactly the way he would have wanted. He has that experience. That adds to it, I think. Mike Babcock's with us from Hale Varsity, Heard Ad Sports, at MD Babs on Twitter. I will say that Nebraska's failed to meet minimal expectations, hence all the coaching changes and whatnot since Bo's last year. I know they hit nine wins. Uh, they overachieved that year based on FPI. But Nebraska all along should have been at minimum a six-win program. And at, at best, you could say seven, seven to eight, okay, aside from that nine-win season in, in 16. So I think you, you've had colossal underachievement. There's been a lot of games you've dropped. You've been favored and been more talented than – and, and then some of the teams in your neighborhood in the West, you've just imploded. You've helped beat yourself as much as the other team beat you in some of those close ball games. We don't need to detail all the one-score losses. So even if half of those go right for you, the law of averages, you're, you're sitting at bull eligibility. There's no way, shape, or form you should have be working on year eight without a bowl game. Mike, who intrigues you? Uh, Nebraska's extremely intriguing. We've laid out the case of what expectations are from a reasonable standpoint and tagging a, a number to that expectation. Who else are you curious about in the Big Ten? Um, I'm interested to see how Oregon makes the transition because I think that, uh, you know, everything I've seen so far is a, it's like Oregon is one of the uh, top content, Ohio State and Oregon. It's like those two teams are seem to be at the top of the, of the uh, big 18. And uh, I want to see how Oregon makes the adjustment to the, to the conference because it is going to be an adjustment. I think week in week it. out for sure. It's going to be an adjustment, and that's the thing. That's the team that intrigues me because it's a good team, a very good team. And how does it how does it compete in in the Big Ten? Do you think they're getting a little too much credit for their lines of scrimmage, or do you think they're as good as advertised? Well, we'll find out. I mean, I you know, smarter people than I am are making these uh, assessments. So. Um, We'll find out, but that's where it has to be to be successful. Probably has to be successful uh, up front. You have to be successful regardless of the conference, but it's there's a lot of emphasis, I think, in the Big Ten, a very physical league, and and uh, and so that's that's going to be an important part of that transition uh, into the Big Ten. It's for, funny, not only Oregon, but uh, Washington, USC, and UCLA. To piggyback on that, I think it's it's lines of scrimmage and. Something that gets slept upon, something I think Husker fans slept on, was is the importance of special teams in the Big Ten. I wonder if any of these West Coast schools are going to be exposed from a special teams point of view, making that adjustment to the Big Ten. Just I think back to Nebraska's transition. That was one of the things that I think bit Nebraska in the butt a little bit, that Schmidt, you, me, fans, coaches themselves didn't quite expect. Well, you just got to gotta make some kicks, either punting or field goals. Babbers, about 10 seconds. What's coming up from you with Hale Varsity? Um, I think the next one, I think the one that came out today maybe was uh, when Nebraska scored 48 points in the in the uh, third quarter against uh, Colorado <laughs> in 1983. 
was it Colorado? Yeah, it was Colorado in 1983. Uh, that was quite the, uh, in the span of about 12 minutes in the third quarter, Nebraska scored 48 points. And total time of possession was about four minutes and 34 seconds. Take it again. That, that'd be all right. why they call it a scoring explosion. There it was. There it was. Mike, we'll see you next week. Thanks again, bud. Thanks for having me, guys. Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? When I point you, yeah. On Hail Varsity Radio. When's the last time Nebraska scored 48 in a game? Uh, was it the Northwestern game, 2021? Yeah, 56 to 7. Sound about right. Is that the last time? Maybe against a nah, cause they, directional they, school. Those have been. I was wondering. It's they been a lost. While. They lost 45 42 to Georgia Southern. I think you might have to go back to 2021 Northwestern. Okay. Let's, I'll, I'll look it up while you while you. Chat. So, for for a little perspective here with with Babber's newsletter from Hale Varsity, and I remember seeing the highlights of that game against uh, Colorado. I think it was Skippy Newheisel that was a quarterback. Now he was the UCLA quarterback. He ended up at Colorado, but yeah, To like was chewing out his his offense, <laughs> and they just flipped the switch and put up forty eight on the buffs and McCartney. We have to ask Barney about that tomorrow. Think about that. Like almost five minutes of game time in the third quarter. I think it started off with a flea flicker where Rogier pitched back to Gill. Gill found Fryer touchdown. Onside kick and uh, the uh, avalanche was real. Keeping with Colorado. Really fast here. I've, I've found information here. Nebraska put up 48-plus points twice in that 2021 season. Can you name the other opponent they did that against? The, it was non-conference. The, no. Their mascot was a ram? Hmm. Fordham. Ah, yes. The fighting uh, Vince Lombardis. Mm-hmm. And before that, you have to go to... And Vince Scully's. Before that, you have to go back to 2019. They put up 54 points on Maryland back in 2019. Okay. Yeah. So it's been a couple of times. Not since Frost left, It's a really, really bad Maryland team. <laughs> it really was. I, I was. I was sitting here thinking, I'm like... Okay, let's go back and look through some of the results. I can just skip right over 2023. I know they didn't do it last year, not even close. So, yeah, 2021, they did it twice. Once against Fordham and once against Northwestern. Now, the expectation when it comes to a number with that expectation, you know, I think we're in that 7 to 8 range. Moonbot checks in uh, out in Colorado. Says uh, Denver Radio talking about... uh, if the Buffs lose to a, quote, crappy Nebraska team, how embarrassing it will be. I don't think your, your Buffs, and they aren't Moonbots, but I don't think the Buffs are going to be a, a favorite, favorite squad uh, coming into Lincoln. Uh, intrigue with this Big Ten. I have a guess on who, which radio show that was out in Denver. Should I say it or, or should I not? It's, it's got to be... Um... Moser, Lombardi, and Kane. That's got to be. In the morning, it. you think? That's got to be, right? Possibly. I, I like that radio show, to be fair. No, they're good I, dudes. I don't listen to them all. Really, time, really talented I, I, folks. I do respect them a lot. So I, I wonder if it was them. Moonball, I'll have to chime in. Walter uh, weighs in. Oregon's at Michigan November 2nd. At Wisconsin November 16th. Uh, that will be interesting. Uh, Elijah wants to go to College Park, says Walter, for crab cakes and football. Not a big seafood guy, personally. No? No, no. It, it's it's not a, a dislike thing. Well, it is kind of a dislike mm. thing. It's, it, but it's more of like a, I can stomach it. I'd rather have the stuff that walks on land. It always, it always tastes better. Uh, yeah, give me the stuff that chicken. moves. Yeah, exactly. Like, that tastes better than tuna. List uh, list your, your, your top three intriguing squads. To me, it, it's got to go... It's got to go Iowa with their offense... Michigan's two for me. What's their staying power like? And, you know, a sneaky game for Nebraska this year is going to be Rutgers in Lincoln. And there's stats in the stream about how bad Rutgers quarterback play has been. 
I'm I'm buying Oregon to yeah. come in and and kick butt and take names in the conference. They are going to be a, a playoff contender slash team, and I think Ohio State. The thing with Ohio State is Will Howard manage and get it to your talent because your line and your defense is going to be good. You've got a running back. You've got wideouts galore. Just don't screw it up if you're Will Howard. I like the Oregon quarterback, Gabriel, the best out of out of anybody because of his experience level. I think Wisconsin okay. will take a little bit of a step forward, too. It can't be this god-awful in year two I need, offensively. I need you to explain your, <clears throat> your Iowa pick to me because they are near the bottom of intriguing teams in the Big Ten to me. Yeah, they bring in a new offensive coordinator, but they still have Kirk Ferentz, who doesn't give a hoot about offensive yardage. Like... Why is that intriguing to you? I, I already know what we're going to expect. It's going to be a slightly improved Iowa offense. They get McNamara back, which is going to mm-hmm. be good for them. So it's well, going to be slightly improved. But the the focus of their team is still going to be defense and special teams. And, and, so that, I don't and that's fine. Intrigue. What, my intrigue is if you get a little bit, again, similar case to Nebraska, if you get a little bit better offensive play, your defense and special teams at Iowa is good enough to win you most games or a lot of games the way you, you typically take care of the football and force some turnovers. So if they the, – the intrigue to me, is it dad telling son or is it just Brian being conservative all these years to get ousted? How much freedom are you going to give the new OC to, to work with some talent? Iowa's had some guys throw the football before. They've had some running backs. They've had, God knows, a lot of offensive linemen to be really high level. They've had tight ends for the <laughs> – just look look, look at your fantasy roster or who you're playing in fantasy football. How many times has an Iowa tight end done you in? So, no, they're intriguing because if, if they take the cuffs off a little bit on the offense, they're, they're, not, they're not a nightmare. They're not a nightmare for their defense. They're not a nightmare when it comes to the pressure they put on their special teams. My, my question – do you have the talent? I don't. I didn't see a flip in talent in one off season that would show me that they have the ability. Well, I think to if you get a healthy, if you, if you have a healthy McNamara, guy's gone to a playoff, and you have a decent run game, an offensive line, and tight ends to throw it to. There's a threat of a run and a pass. You're not abysmal running the football, and you're not throwing it with the wrong with the wrong arm. On, on offense at, at quarterback because who's the the big pile of goo they had last year? Uh, Padilla or Padilla? Uh, one, yeah, him. And oh, no, they, and then you had the, uh, the, the big old guy. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. Who's a pile of goo? <laughs> <laughs> went to Utah Southwest Northern State uh, in, the, need, in the portal. We need crew in the stream chat here to let us know. His, he was very forgettable. Right, right but he's, he's still, still, he's still one in Lincoln. It's yeah. my point, man. <laughs> <laughs> because they screwed up one last time. And I see, I, so that's my intrigue. I see, and this is no discredit to Iowa. I just don't think it's intriguing in any way, shape, or form. I, if, if you have incremental progress on offense, cool. They're a better football team, but it's still not intriguing to me. Uh, to me, it's it's Oregon. If they the get of any list. offense with their defense and special teams, they'll they'll be higher up in the Big Ten finish. These are easy answers because they're all probably going to finish near the top of the Big Ten. Um, but to me, it's Oregon 1. How do they adjust to a new league? To me, it's Michigan 2. Sharon Moore, does he try to put his fingerprints on the Michigan program, or is it more the same with Harbaugh's way? And then 3, Penn State. James Franklin, I'm not going to call it a make or break year. Deacon Hill, someone chimes yes, in. Deacon, Deacon. Hill is The Deacon. Biscuits and gravy. Um, but to me, it's number 3, Penn State. It's not a make or break year for James Franklin, but you've been waiting for that breakthrough into potential top four Top 12 college football playoff. Can they make that leap this year in a year that where... That blocked punt against Ohio State to win the leagues a long time ago in Happy Valley. We'll wind down Hour 1. Evan Bland on the way. It's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. And now... And now... Back to Hale Varsity Radio. What are you doing? New intro. Thank you. No? Chuck asks... The, the younger folks would understand that beat. No. <laughs> See, I, I I played it on Memorial Day because I knew you couldn't say anything on Memorial Day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hate it. Just give me a little background. It's from the the Drake and Kendrick beef. Oh, 
Yes. Well, thank it, you. It was, a, it was a diss beef directed at Drake. So mm. technically, Hail Varsity Radio has now officially taken the side of Kendrick and the Drake and, and Kendrick beef. Which fine, we fine with me. I think Junior's seen Kendrick before. So as, as have I. Great, great live performance. Yep. Yeah. And he's seen Drake too. He went. He just saw Drake so over he, spring break. He needs to pick a side. I haven't pinned him down on that one. A uh, reminder to get buckled up, use your seatbelt. It saves lives, prevents injuries only if properly worn. Make it click. A message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Walter, outside of Philly, says Penn State fans constantly throw Drew Aller under the bus. 25 touchdowns, two picks last season. It's a five-star. He's a redshirt now, a redshirt sophomore. Penn State's got their dude. Uh, to uh, to make that jump, they had three guys in the first round last year, or first couple of rounds. They're always that front seven's pretty solid. They've got a corner that always seems to go every three or four years. Had an offensive tackle this year and a loaded tackle draft. Chuck asked the question: two things, and Walter's right. Turnovers get me triggered. Two things: are you going to Stillwater and? Uh, Schmidt gets a steak and a beer, if I remember correctly. Yes, Minnesota won and won by what, four? I think we're even, because I think you won going into the holiday weekend. I did. You covered. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I think I'm, I'm I've just lost two straight. Okay, so I'm I'm now up on the steak and the beer. Cause I took Dallas, but I don't think Dallas covered that line on Saturday, did they? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, no, on Stillwater, I'm thinking what we do, Elijah, is while Nebraska's on it too, and your friends at AM590, Omaha's ESPN will have Nebraska on the horn for you, as well as our friends at News Talk 900 Columbus. I think we'll throw a couple of steaks on the grill. We'll take my TV back from Junior's room to the patio. We'll fire up uh, some giant steaks, and then uh, we'll do the show at four. Okay. Also, I'll have to make the the trek across town. But you at least get steak (laughs) and a beer, even though you owe me steak and a beer. (laughs) I'll take that deal. Uh, deal. So I think it's a patio show Friday. Quick question that I have. Weather permitting. Yes. But quick question that I have here. Is Stillwater in reference to like water around that city that is like a lake that does not move much or is it in reference to like moonshining and like the the, the liquid that comes out of a still being you know eventually with i i don't know but from what you hear about still water it is it's probably the drinking side of not a shock that them, them cowboys have been on probation from time to time for luring talent to that venue <laughs> Ah. <laughs> how did uh, how the hell did Dez get to Oklahoma State? How did Blackman get to Oklahoma State? How Brandon did Hart- Whedon? How did how did Hartley <laughs> Dykes get to Oklahoma State? How did Thurman Thomas get to Oklahoma State? How did Barry Sanders get to Oklahoma State? Are you telling me they didn't pay the twenty seven year old dad Brandon Whedon to come to Oklahoma State? I think they offered hair plugs. <laughs> Hour two coming up. Hail Varsity powered by Cornhead Lager. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hail Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbal. Back with you, it's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We welcome in with the Omaha World Herald, Evan Bland joins us at Evan Bland OWH, is where you follow him on Twitter. Evan, uh, how quickly have you or can you make it to Stillwater? Well, it's been a while. I mean, Nebraska baseball went to Oklahoma City in in nineteen, so that doesn't quite count. It's I think it's for me. It's been since the '07 football game when Nebraska went down there to play the Cowboys, and and T Boone Pickens Stadium was just coming up. So I was probably going a little faster, and maybe in my college days. Um, 
So it's it's been a minute since I've been down that way, but I, I just know, you know, you go to York and you hang a left and you wait long enough and you're in Big 12 country. So uh, we'll get there eventually. I don't know exactly the ETA. I think the question with how long it's going to take down there, as we were talking before, is, is how long he spins at the casino on the way down in there. Because I believe, if I remember correctly, before the turnoff to Stillwater, you cross the border from Kansas into Oklahoma, and there's a couple different casinos on Native American land down there. If I remember correctly, Evan, that's just throwing it out there. Well, I'm going to have to take your word for that one. There are some, like, sometimes there are those trips, usually for football, like where you go and you kind of have time to do whatever. This one will be a little bit tighter because I actually have to go down in the morning for uh, uh, media availability. They're going to talk. But, uh, you know, maybe that's a good thing to uh, not have <laughs> too much extra time on the way down. Well, while we're talking gambling here, Evan, if you trust Vegas, the, the odds makers in Vegas have the Stillwater Regional as the most wide-open regional among any of them, uh, Oklahoma State's plus money to win the regional. Florida State, or Florida, excuse me, is not far behind. Nebraska comes in at, uh, just over plus 300 in the odds. Does that seem fair to you, the fact that this Stillwater region is, is wide open and there's three teams that could take it? Is that a, an accurate assessment from the folks out in the desert? I mean, they usually know what they're talking about. Um, I don't. I don't know what their accuracy is with college baseball uh, odds and, and setting that. But yeah, I mean, I would. I, I feel that way. Like, yeah, Florida just got in, and a lot of their numbers aren't pretty. But you know, your numbers probably aren't going to look pretty in in a conference that sends eleven teams to the NCAA tournament. Uh, obviously, Oklahoma State just had a really good season, won the Big Twelve tournament. They look like a really complete team, but not one without flaws either. And obviously everyone around here just saw what Nebraska can do when it all comes together from the pitching side and offensively. So, yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon in this format, in this tournament, to have a number one regional seed go down. I think almost half the field didn't survive its own regional last year. So it's not crazy to think that that sort of thing can happen. It's baseball. Wild things come into play. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think I would be bold enough to put money on any of these teams just because of how erratic and, and wide open it is. But uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think the weather should be decent. And this park, which is still pretty new, is known as a launching pad this time of year, too. So you would think uh, there are going to be some pretty entertaining games. Evan Bland with his Husker baseball uh, in Stillwater Friday. Hail Varsity Radio, Evan with the Omaha World Herald at Evan Bland, OWH. So you had a really good story today, Evan, when it comes to the style and the momentum here with this opening contest. And as you've covered Will Bolt for a number of years here, what what's your sense of, of Coach and, and, and even Coach Childress? Did they think this team – could peak at the right time. I know they're they're always about the work and grinding, but you want to talk about getting the right payoff. There's still work to do, clearly, still ball to play, but what a response in the Big Ten tournament where it really all did come together. Uh, hitting with scoring position, runners in scoring position, uh, not just your, your two main arms for the season, and then a little bit of power from a couple of guys. Yeah, you know, the if Nebraska does go on to make some noise here this week or beyond, like I think we will look back at the Big Ten tournament and say, like, they figured some things out at that point. And it's not because they needed to win it. In fact, I, I still am of the belief that if they had gone 0-2, they still would be a two-seed somewhere in a regional. So it, it wasn't from that standpoint, but it was – uh, you know, I think they found some momentum there. They found certainly some individual breakouts with what Gabe Swanson did and, and Josh Karen kind of took the next step. You saw multiple pitchers do things on a big stage that they haven't really done before and Will Walsh and Drew Christo and Jackson Brockett. And so I, I think all that kind of plays into it. And then the other thing I've been saying this week is I, it feels to me like Nebraska kind of figured out or, or closed the gap on some of the experience that they didn't have in the postseason. They played on Saturday in front of 10,000 people. They played on Sunday in front of 13,000. They weathered elimination games. And so, like, they're playing a Florida team that's gone to the tournament 16 
straight spring, uh, straight, straight summers. You've got Oklahoma State, which is there every year. Nebraska hadn't had that experience. It kind of felt like they caught up on it a little bit, a little bit maybe reminiscent of some of those Big 12 runs that they had in the early 2000s when they won the thing and, and kind of kept going. Um, and it's a really interesting contrast to me with Florida as the first draw where you have a, a team over there that obviously was in the College World Series final a year ago, but they, they were one and done in the SEC tournament. Uh, they spent most of a week sweating out their at-large status, and they're going to have not played for 10 days before they take on Nebraska on Friday. So to me, it's a fascinating clash of teams that kind of feel like they're going different directions, even though Florida's the big brand name. Uh, It just feels like Nebraska was the one that figured itself out last week and probably wants to get back on the diamond sooner. The the thing about this regional, when you look at Florida Friday, a potential matchup with Oklahoma State, is you're running into some teams that, have made their money being extremely offensive, now going to an offensive ballpark in O'Brate. Is that a concern to you at all, the fact that the sluggers that this Florida lineup has, the sluggers that are on Oklahoma State can really find their footing? Or do you think Nebraska showed enough to you in the, the Big Ten tournament with their pitching to think that Nebraska's pitching can keep those offenses in check? Well, that's the big question. If the wind is howling out, as it sounds like it often does down there this time of year, then you know, watch out with some of those fly balls. I did think there were instances in Omaha last week where there were flyouts, you know, maybe close to the warning track or, or even to the wall that at O'Brate are probably going to be in the third row that are going to, uh, you know, be two run homers or whatever it might be. So uh, that to me is one of the big question marks. Like Nebraska stands out in this field for its pitching depth. It certainly stands out for its ability to generate offense uh, unconventionally, like drawing walks, stealing bases, hits, hit and runs, uh, things of that nature. Oklahoma State and Florida are much more of kind of the major league approach where it's they're going to draw a lot of walks, they're going to hit a lot of home runs, uh, and if the long ball isn't working for them, they're not really teams that, generate runs a lot of other ways so i think the onus absolutely is on nebraska to keep them in the park i think if they do uh they have a great chance to be competitive and and maybe win some games in Stillwater. if they don't then you're you're suddenly finding yourself maybe in more of a slugfest and that's not really nebraska's game as much they want to get ahead kind of make you make you press on the other side uh, and then be able to to kind of add on with the speed on the base paths and and you know force the defense to make mistakes. So uh, I think that's it's a really fascinating setup. Um, probably not the ballpark Nebraska would have chosen if it could have picked a venue. But uh, again, the, the clash of strengths to me makes it one of the more compelling storylines this weekend. Evan, how do you think Nebraska's arms? This is super hypothetical, but you've seen a lot of baseball. How do you think they they would translate in the SEC? And I ask that because we're talking strength on strength, Nebraska's arms versus Florida's offense, and we know that their strength of schedule uh, rewarded them with the number one strength of schedule, seven and eight uh, against top eight seats, right? Eight eight teams that are hosting. So Florida beat a lot of good ball clubs this year. I know they lost some games that Florida typically doesn't lose, but – when we go to to Nebraska's strength, are, are does Nebraska's arms have enough stuff to to baffle this offense? Yeah, that's a great question, Schmidt. I mean, I I think you can kind of you have it a little bit of both ways. Like you've got Florida on the one side, whose numbers aren't great, but like you put it in context because they played in a conference that just sent eleven to the NCAA tournament. I think Nebraska is a little bit on the other end of that thing, where a lot of their numbers are good and you almost have to discount them a little bit just because of the league that they play in. So like I've thought that over the years, oftentimes, and and you look at like they're pitching this year, they're just inside the top 25 in ERA, like in my, in my mind, and this is super unscientific, unscientific, Mm -hmm. but I just kind of think, okay, I'm going to drop it, you know, maybe 20 spots in ERA. So like, I still think they're a top 50 club, but if they played in the sec, yeah, I mean, their numbers wouldn't be, what they are on that side of things. So I, you know, I still think they, they've got a, a solid staff, a deep staff, a, a better staff, quite honestly, than what Florida has at this moment. Oklahoma State, I think, pretty clearly has the best overall 
staff in this regional. They've got two pitchers with 110 plus strikeouts. Uh, they're the only program in the country that they, that can say that. So they have a couple of, of true co aces as well. But this is always that fun time of year, man, where uh, you know you, you kind of put your stuff on the line against the best of the best. And so, like if what we saw Nebraska do all year offensively and on the mound, like if that translates to Friday, and they can beat Florida kind of the way that they've beaten a lot of teams this year. I mean, what a jolt of momentum. What a, another piece of validation that says, yeah, this team is for real. This team uh, can make some noise, do some damage here coming up. I, I already think they're to the point where they're not going to be intimidated by the crowd or the name on the, on the on the chest of the other team. But, I mean, if you can come out in that opener and kind of win the game the way that you want to and shut down that Florida lineup because, hey, you have the Big Ten Pitcher of the Year. But I think that does go a long way further in saying, yeah, you know, they belong and uh, they're going to be a tough out whenever that might be. Evan, whenever you look at Matt, or excuse me, uh, Will Bolt's tenure at Nebraska at a whole, where he's at in that tenure, I think a lot of people considered 2021 in Ar- against Arkansas, the Fayetteville Regional. It was a win to take that awesome Arkansas team to a game seven, to a winner take all type regional environment on a Monday night. What is success to you defined as in this Stillwater regionals winning the whole thing? What is going to define success performing well against sec and big 12 opponents? What do you think success will be in this regional given will bolts entire track record at Nebraska? I mean, I think at least making the regional final again, pushing, Oklahoma State to a, an elimination type setting where maybe it comes down to one game and it's baseball, right? Like you come down to one game, all kinds of crazy kooky things can happen. But I think if you put yourself in that position uh, at, at, at their venue, um, you, you got to feel pretty good about that season, especially when you think back and uh, you know, not a lot of people maybe thought that Nebraska was in position to be in the NCAA tournament or, or contend in the big 10 this year. There were a lot of question marks. And I think what we've seen is there's been a lot of development uh, all over the place. I mean, Josh Karen got a lot better this year. Brett Sears is one of the most, uh, I think, fascinating uh, meteoric rises of any Husker athlete on in any sport this year. And what he's, what he's done in a year. So like guys, you've seen guys develop, you've seen guys uh, kind of figure things out, but there's no doubt. Like if you were to get to a super regional, That'd be a big deal for this program, something they haven't done since their last College World Series appearance in 2005. And it just, you know, most of the time they haven't even really been that close in a regional format. So, yeah, I mean, if you can go and, and beat Oklahoma State and beat Florida, I mean, those are two nationally known, nationally talked about programs that would get a lot of attention. Uh, obviously locally, but around the country from people that follow college baseball too. And so, I mean, super regionals, then you're talking best two out of three. Nebraska's lost just two weekends all season. So uh, I think things can get pretty exciting pretty quickly if that were to come to pass. And, um, you know, I think their draw too would, would add to that as well. Like they're not, this isn't number one, Tennessee. This isn't number two, Kentucky. They're playing, um, a good Oklahoma state team, but not one that's unbeatable by any means. Uh, and on the other side, you've got the, the number six Clemson regional. That's, that's, you know, you can handle that. That's, that's reasonable, I think. So the draw sets up well, the momentum sets up well, it's all about going out and doing it. I think if you if you were to go into that, that absolutely be a disappointment at this point, given what they have. Um, but now now's the fun part. You kind of figure out um, you know what guys are made of on the biggest stage. And I think Nebraska, if last week is in any any, any indication, uh, these guys are ready to go and and uh, you know they've been resilient all year. Why not for another few weeks? Haven't got about a minute here. Are you surprised the Big Ten got three in? Indiana and, uh, of course, Illinois getting the nod. Yeah, I didn't think Indiana would get in. I mean, it's rare as the occasion when a, a Big Ten team with an RPI above 50 gets an at-large bid and, and the benefit of the doubt from a selection committee. So I didn't think they would get in. I thought it would be a two-bid league with 
Illinois and Nebraska, and obviously they almost had four if Penn State had won the tournament uh, in that in that championship Sunday. But it's a good sign for the league, and and now they can turn next year to adding those West Coast schools as well, and we'll see how much that raises the profile of things. But I think three needs to probably be the minimum that this league can expect moving forward with the financial resources that it has. The coaching is getting a lot better in that league too, uh, but good for Indiana. We'll see if they can go down and, and make some noise in their regional this weekend. Um, but uh, as of right now, it, it kind of feels like the league is kind of what it is. We'll see if that can change with the new additions. Evan Bland, Omaha World Herald at Evan Bland, OWH, all the Husker baseball you want. And uh, he'll be in Stillwater for you. Evan will check in soon. Thanks for the time, man. Thanks, guys. See ya. There he is, Evan Bland with us. Open phones here. When we come back, it's Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Good stuff from Stuart Mandel's college football mailbag we'll get into a few more thoughts on nebraska baseball so uh no on the roadie to stillwater yes on the backyard barbecue and a patio show is is what friday's outlook is like 489 to get in here on hail varsity radio we're Powered by Cornhead Lager. Just a couple of things here on on baseball. The experience part of this thing with Nebraska and, and Evan touched on it. The experience has grown for Nebraska's pitching. We heard Will Bolt talk about it yesterday with some of these arms being asked to do things that they didn't really do well midweek or even sometimes on Sundays. But when it came to elimination time in Omaha, Nebraska's arms, the Waldrons, the Christos, the Brockets were new dudes. They they looked uh, incredible. Did you throw Waldron in there? Yeah. Waldron had a great night last night for the Padres. Excuse me, Waldron. I did through Walter. Right there. <laughs> well, hell yeah, he did. And they can get him back, man. Yeah, that changed. That changed. Get Waldron the- back. That was awful. Can I we would burn the tape. I would can love we burn to see, all of the tape. I would love to see Oklahoma State try to hit that knuckleball. Like, if you can get him back for the weekend, I really would say it changes the complexion completely for Husker baseball. I, I think I. They'd be the favorite, in my opinion, to go win that regional. Yeah. Well, Waldron, uh, forgive me. Forgive me. It happens. Uh, so back to the dugout chatter. Kyle Perry's the uh, most experienced Husker in his 37th season uh, in Lincoln, but he did toss some innings back in the 2019 regional four and a third, uh, and uh, also got the win over number one seed Arkansas. If you think about that in 2021, you need to channel that KP back. Uh, you have Brumbaugh. Uh, he once got a ninth inning walk as a pinch hitter late in a blowout win while uh, with Okie State. They hate being called that, Oklahoma State. And um, reliever Grant Clevelanger uh, faced LSU, uh, one LSU batter in that 2023 regional with Tulane. Uh, Garrett Englum, uh, two-way player. Will Walsh is who I was mentioning, forgive me. But uh, Will Walsh redshirted the, during the 2021 regional run. So that's the experience you're taking with you down to Stillwater. First rodeo in a rodeo land for a lot of Nebraska's guys. So when we talk about some college football thoughts, interested to get your take here, Elijah. I have not uh, gotten Stewart's picks from the mailbag, but he was asking about the most prestigious jobs right now in college football. The top six, who are they? Also, when we talk about this Oregon factor to the Big Ten, that's the team he's buying stock in because of Nike, because of Big Ten money, because of what Oregon is, because of Lanning, and they'll always be able to go get a quarterback. They've got a five star in waiting. <laughs> Uh, after Dylan Gabriel finishes his 37th season of college football. He's selling stock in Penn State. So we can revisit this in July. 
But here in May, late May, as we knock on the door of June, I am in agreement. I'm buying stock in Oregon. The second stock I'm buying is Nebraska. If I'm selling stock, I'm not quite ready to sell Penn State stock. I still think they're going to be a 8-9 win team. They need a big win here this season to get people off a big game James or lack thereof off his back. But I'd be selling stock probably in Minnesota uh, for certain just because I think their head coach wants a bigger stage and is probably tired of putting in 8-9 win seasons. I know they suffered last year. But even an 11-win season with some big wins, and it's it's an NFL town. It's a it's a ba- major league baseball town. He's he's overshadowed, and he, I mean he chased UCLA and some other gigs. So I'm 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 selling Minnesota. Not that they're on that same level as as Minnesota, or I should say as Penn State. But that that's who I'm selling. Or would you sell Penn State stock? Who would you sell? I might even sell Michigan stock. Well, well, in and in terms of buying stock here, I'm assuming we're we're seeing the 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 profit on our return. Should these teams be consistent college football playoff type performers? I assume that's the level we're talking about here. You're going to get three in at a minimum. So, so the what I'm looking for, and and first and foremost, the team has to be in a premier college football conference. I assume we're zooming in on the Big Ten here. Um, and the second thing you look for in the modern era is the ability to go out and recruit. You can do that with a a fantastic head coach, but the way a lot of teams are doing it right now is with NIL money. Mm -hmm. Like, you look at a team that you would have done really well buying stock in two years ago, Missouri. They have good NIL resources. Drink's good. And Drinkowitz has been very, very solid for that Missouri team. killed it in recruiting that state. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You combine those two things, a a good recruiting head coach, the NIL resources, a developmental-type program is kind of a nice thing to boot as well. But that's what I'm looking for in terms of a team that I can buy stock in. This might be unpopular. Um, how about Indiana? Maybe not as a college football playoff performer, but as a team that could exceed expectations. Again, you're going to be a pain in the ass to deal with. Because uh, Soraka has led to a little bit of juice on the recruiting trail. There's uh, that Julian kid, I can't remember his last name, current Florida State commit. They're getting a visit from a five-star quarterback this summer. Indiana. And it sounds like it's not just their basketball team that's getting NIL resources. It sounds like their football team is starting to get some of those as well, and they're starting to get some of the, the rewards from that. Soraka is really doing a great job drumming up support for the Indiana football program. There's a little bit of steam, maybe not nationally, but within the state of Indiana. I wouldn't be shocked, and I doubted that hire when they first made it. Now that we're six months on the job, I wouldn't be surprised to see Indiana gain just a little bit of momentum. Again, maybe not a consistent college football playoff performer, but a team that's consistently going bowling and a team that's consistently a, a threat to the top mm. teams in the conference would not surprise me. And I, I am looking for an answer that's a little more off the beat. Did they finally path. get it right? I mean, because they had the old PE teacher there, great defensive mind, but eventually ran out of Kevin, uh, what's his bucket? At, at Tulsa now, uh, the former Oklahoma offensive coordinator. What? Ran out of... His, he was the guy along with DeBoer that brought Penix. Oh, we're talking recruiting. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Kevin Wilson. Kevin Wilson was at Indiana, kind of abrasive, punted him. Uh, PE coach took over. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, got popped. DeBoer uh, was the OC there in, in 19 and then went and took the Fresno gig. So he was a lot of the brains behind it. And they're, they're not close to the eight-win squad they, they once were, right? They were a eight and 8-2 team during COVID. I mean, they were, they were probably the second best team in the Big Ten that year. And then it... They went their, their window shut. But it, it showed me that they can at least get some There's players. Momentum. You can get momentum mm-hmm. at Indiana. And you have to find the right coach that can continue drumming up support from the NIL folks, the boosters within that state. Soraka's done a pretty good job of that early. I, I, I think Indiana is a team that could surprise some people. Maybe not college football playoff appearances, but I think they could be respectable. So uh, Shane asked the question, Wisconsin, are they going to – Get back to relevance. 
I hope you sold your stock last year. That's me. I, I, I'm not going to sell stock. I think Fickle's going to be fine there. It's just, will the, the, the natives there in cheese curd in Miller Light land put up with not running the football on third and goal inside the five because it's worked for 30 years with Barry and then with Brett? as long as they start winning but it's hard to stomach for those fans up there to to see three wide in the shotgun at the three yard line and not being able to run the football their whole line's been the, the issue they've sucked at recruiting offensive line comparatively speaking well i think an issue that i see that i think is going to rear its ugly head in a couple of years do you know how many recruits in the class of 2024 wisconsin had from in-state four three that's what can't do that. That's what was was bread and multiple butter. coaches. Bielema, I mean, especially it's Barry. It's Barry. Barry. That was Go the find bread and big butter. body dudes. Go find big body corn fed Wisconsin kids that are going to come be your offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. They like to hurt people. I mean, I just see a lot of issues with the way that program is being constructed. Also, maybe not necessarily understanding the formula for success. Are there not some parallels to Callahan? A little, little bit. That's what I see from the outside looking in. I see parallels to Callahan trying to completely change the culture of a program, trying to change the offensive scheme, trying to change what's won for years. You to can, go after these shiny, flashy recruits that don't want to come to Wisconsin. You can change it, but you better be right. Yes. You better be right, and your offense better work sooner rather than later. Here are your top six most prestigious programs um, my list said Bama, Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State, Texas, and uh, USC. The list says Bama, Notre Dame, Michigan, USC, Oklahoma, Ohio State. So I'm not far off. Is Texas in that prestige category? Can you put Georgia in there? They've been great the last four years, but they've underachieved for the last 40 before Kirby got there. Notre Dame's always going to be, wow. Bama is the place you go to, to go win titles, and you're not afraid to follow not just one shadow of big old bear, but now the shadow of Saban. Uh, Michigan uh, is, is always pretty legendary. Ohio State's right up there as well. You think of that with college football. Oklahoma is is really elite but they're not a prestigious job i mean you don't leave oklahoma even if it is for usc if it's that prestigious sc's in there but they've top six. not your top six they they just they they get in their own way it feels like is lsu prestigious i mean i still think of florida is a prestigious job but they same with miami miami yeah I think both of those in Florida State. Maybe I'm too old school with that, but uh, Nebraska, I don't know. As it currently stands, my top six in college football, no particular order here. Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia, Alabama, Texas. That's that's your ranking order or just? Just no, no, no particular order. Sure. The number one, I'm probably going to go Bama, Bama over, over Notre Dame. Those are the one, too. So we'll get you to a jock doc. Hail Varsity continues. We're powered by Cornhead Lager. And now. And now. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back into it. It's Hail Varsity powered by Cornhead Lager. Time for a jock doc Wednesday. Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, how are we doing? Hey, I'm doing great, guys. How are you doing? We're good. We are good. We're doing better than than Braves fans right now with Ronald Acuna Jr. done after a complete tear of his left ACL. Did that in the first inning of Sunday's game against the Pirates. And, Dr. Brandon, let's talk about Acuna here, uh, this surgical reconstruction, the ups and downs of that and this is not uncommon is it to have the other knee go after you tear the previous one yeah absolutely you know we've talked a lot on here about uh, you know acl injuries and unfortunately how common they can be and then you start dealing with we've had you know discussions about 
re-tearing on the side of the injury versus, you know, what is the risk of tearing on the other side if you've had one. Um, all definitely risks that are there. Having, you know, tears kind of on both sides definitely kind of speaks to some of that, some of the genetics we talked about before that likely play a role here, not truly confirmed, but likely play a role. Um, but, you know, just kind of getting into our nuts and bolts on the ACL Anatomically, as we've talked about before, there's two kind of those major kind of front and back supporting ligaments within the knee. That uh, main one, the ACL, is what essentially stops your shin or your tibia from sliding forward, and that's essentially what he tore. So that'd be the ACL. The other big one behind that's called the PCL, and that stops the shin or the tibia from going the opposite direction or to the back, called posterior. Uh, but essentially, I had a tear here. Um, you know, typically with these, if you start to get above, a, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent tear, um, they usually are clinically, you know, deficient enough that you're going to need to have it fixed. There are some partial tears that some athletes can play with. It just kind of depends on the level you're at and really kind of how much a stretch is there. Uh, but traditionally, these are fixed with surgery. Um, typically not something you can just go in and kind of sew back together. You have to do essentially a reconstruction, remake the ligament is typically how we fix these. There's been a lot of research into trying to figure out can you do repairs, when is the right scenario for repair, and it's quite small in terms of the number of those that actually can be repaired, and even with that, the data is still a bit mixed if that's even a good option in terms of repair versus remaking it or reconstructing it. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here, a Jock Doc Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio, talking Ronald Acuna Jr., the knee injury that he suffered. And Dr. Brandon, one of the things that's interesting here is that I think back to my intramural soccer days back in college. Uh, I had a buddy, Paul, who he was pre-med. He felt a pop in his knee. He diagnosed himself that he had torn his ACL during the soccer game, and, and he was correct. That's what's interesting about this injury is that Acuna didn't feel a pop. He didn't feel anything in his knee when it went. Uh, he said it wasn't painful and even said before it was diagnosed that he didn't think it was that bad. What does that tell you? Does that change anything, the fact that he didn't feel it was severe, he didn't feel a pop, he didn't feel any pain? Yeah, you know, typically with these, if, if an athlete has had one before, they, they tend to know that feel of, you know, what that big pop is like, what that shifting event is like. So that's kind of your classic if they have another one kind of scenario. But in this case, you know, didn't feel that. Usually when I'll have athletes come in that have, you know, a, a, like a second tear like this or a tear on the other side, and if they don't notice it much, it probably means they had probably a partial injury here before, so they maybe kind of had stretched that ligament out a little bit before, not enough that it was, you know, clinically significant. And then you have that one event happen where it's not super um, noticeable. Um, it's there, and you have kind of another stretch that finally takes it to that level where it's clinically significant enough where you just don't quite have the stability you need to cut. That's probably what happened here. Usually in those scenarios, too, when we shoot MRIs on these to look at them, uh, they may not have as big as kind of like bruises in the bone that we tr traditionally see with ACL tears. Sometimes they have really not much bruising even at all, uh, which again would indicate kind of a lower level of trauma. But if somebody has a high-grade tear and not much bruising, probably means they've had kind of this chronic repetitive kind of partial tearing process going on for some time. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a Jock Doc Wednesday, Ronald Acuda Jr., Star and reigning MVP for Atlanta, done for the year with a torn left ACL. Dr. Brandon, you go back to Akuta's rookie year in 2018, had a mild left ACL sprain and a left knee contusion. Could that predispose him for a tear in the left ligament? Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's really interesting history to note. Um, and so, you know, we had a contusion in the past, so probably was, you know, high-grade enough from that perspective that he had what we call kind of pivot-shift contusions where when those two bones kind of mash against each other hard enough, you'll get this bruise in the bone. Um, so he probably, as that indicated, probably had a reasonably significant injury at that time. It just wasn't enough to create clinically significant instability. Would we look at... The time missed here, you had a study that was done, and you look at lower, lower extremity injuries here for baseball athletes. Baseball athletes suffer this ACL injury just 2% of the time, this specific injury when we look at all knee injuries. Uh, that being said, it's responsible for the most missed time. Do you think Acuna can be the same guy when he does return to play after a lengthy 
recovery period? Can he be the same hitter? Yeah, you know, Chris, that's a great question. So now you take a, a gentleman who's had, now he's going to have two ACL tears, two reconstructions, uh, granted not the same side. Um, you know, is he a different player when he comes back? You know, I think that's probably to be determined. I think he's still a, a pretty stinking good hitter. Um, probably won't have, a, I would say, a tremendous impact on the hitting piece of it. Um, if anything, I would say probably inhibit some of maybe the um, fielding uh, activities he's doing. You know, maybe he's not quite as fast as he was before. Maybe he doesn't quite have that you know, first step like he has. Maybe that mobility is a touch different. Uh, but I, think it, I don't think it would be a significant deficit as long as he rehabs well and as long as we've, as we talked about before, as long as he doesn't have those other kind of cumulative injuries like, you know, cartilage injury, chip off cartilage, or where he has a really significant meniscal injury, if it's kind of a pure ACL and not much on the other side of things, then he probably does really well and probably doesn't have a whole lot of a deficit kind of moving forward um, from that perspective. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here, a Jock Doc Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio. And Dr. Brandon, last thought before we get you out. One of the things that's interesting about this is it's pretty rare for Major League Baseball players to have an ACL injury in each knee and come back to play. And obviously, we're expecting Acuna to come back with the, the modern health and the modern science that goes into knee reconstructions. But is it fair to say that it's a bit of a of a a wild west in terms of what this could be. We, we aren't really sure what his return to play will look like, at least uh, his level of play, considering the fact that it hasn't been done very often. Yeah, true. Yeah, very true. Uh, but I still think you have enough of a, kind of a guide with other sports, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially things that are you know, pretty demanding in terms of cutting, jumping type sports with these. And I think the track record is there to indicate I think he's going to do quite well. Um, you know, then you start getting that debate of like, how long do you go here? I mean, he's going to be a, a good, you know, nine or ten months is kind of that traditional length of time before they return at that level, and I think that still puts him in a good spot, you know, to come back next year and do really well. Dr. Brandon, we love the insight. Thanks for your expertise as always. We'll run you down again next week, and thanks for the time as always. Okay, fellas, you guys take care. Good to hear from Dr. Brandon Seifert, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. A Jock Doc Wednesday will wind down this uh, Wednesday edition with Hale Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager. One more segment to go. Maybe another steak and a beer bet. We'll find out. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time on a Wednesday. Big thanks to Mike Babcock from Hale Varsity Heard at Sports. Evan Bland with us, Dr. Brandon Seifert. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herb will get the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Those platforms, Hale Varsity Radio is the search. And uh, give us a rating, good, bad, ugly. We love the feedback. Also like and subscribe. Hale Varsity YouTube can watch the show as well as listen on the Hale Varsity Radio Network. Hale Varsity Twitter is where you can rewind the show as well at H Varsity Radio. Give that a follow. So this just in on Angel Hernandez. Reports are coming out. Angel Hernandez retirement came out of a meeting with top MLB officials. Officials were questioning Hernandez's ability to see and comprehend Correctly, Angel got so worked up that he slammed the door behind him as he exited. It took Angel 10 minutes to realize that he was in the closet. (laughs) His announcement of retirement came soon after. (laughs) That's pretty funny. We ran out of time with Jabba, but I love the Will Clark reel I saw on Instagram today. And I I need to play this for us this week. Dub it. Bleep it. Oh, Will, the thrill. It's talking about (laughs) about going up to bat. And you got Will Clark, you know, nearly a career 300 hitter. Loved watching him play big time at first. Him and Mark Grace in the 80s. And Clark's up there and he took strike two on the apparently outside, outside court. He's like, Angel, is that as far as it's going to go? Was very respectful, and, and Will's always said, look, that's 
always plan to be respectful to umpires. Those with mustaches named Elijah. And then on the next pitch was even further outside than that strike two call. And Will Clark rung him up. And he's like, Angel, dude, you, uh, you said it wasn't going to go out any further than that. And, and Angel's like, oh, it, it broke across. So later that night, Will Clark's out at the bar and Angel's there with some of the umpires. And Will goes over, sees Angel's had a couple, three beers and says to the bartender, hey, I want to take care of his, his bar tab. And Will's got a beer. He's like, hey, see you at the ballpark tomorrow. And <laughs> Angel's like, is, is that all you got to say to me? And Will's like, yep, took care of you. And Angel's like, well, hey, thanks for the beer. So Will ends his story putting two little mini self-made goggles, his hands over his eyes. He's like, the rest of my career, in my bleep and strike zone was this. <laughs> Where you buy Angel a couple, three beers, kiss his backside a little bit, and Angel liked Will Clark. So the strike zone was wonderful. Could all be so simple. Yeah. Co- coaches, <laughs> high school athletes out there, take some notes. Bring a six pack whenever Elijah Herbal's working wow. on your games. I'm kidding. Kind of. Yeah, 12. <laughs> <laughs> 12, not six. I will say, I think, I think Angel Hernandez, some of the jabs he takes are. Very well warranted. Other times I go, yeah. Piling on? Other times I go, I've seen other umpires make that same call there, and they don't get plastered all over Twitter, but whenever you have a reputation, you have a reputation. He's earned that reputation. He's, he's earned it, and it's fare thee well. And sue the league and then go to retire. Back at four tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in to Hail Varsity, powered by Cornhead Lager.